Well, hi, everyone. Pleasure to be here and an honor. And I should start by saying that you guys, you are very, very lucky. I remember when I was taking my engineering course, I was kind of dreaming about coming to Stanford. But, you know, at that point in time, I had no money, and it was a two-year MBA program. So I had to, you know, abort that idea and go to Switzerland. But, uh, you know, 20 years afterwards, I'm here talking to you. So really, really a pleasure. Huh? <laughs> so uh, today, we are going to be talking a little bit about our company, about the sugar cane industry, about ethanol, sugar, and uh, cogeneration of energy. And in order to do that, we are going to be splitting our discussion in uh, five topics, if you like. A quick introduction about Cosan. Afterwards, we are going to talk about the, the past uh, of the sugarcane industry in Brazil. We are going to be talking about the present and you know, also about the future. And afterwards, we are going to be coming with our uh, final message. And of course, we are going to be opening for uh, questions and answers. In terms of a brief introduction to Cosan, who are we? So we are a leading ethanol and sugar high growth company in Brazil with low cost, large scale and integrated operations. In fact, we are the largest grower and processor of sugar cane in the world. We are also the largest ethanol and sugar producer in Brazil. We are one of the top three ethanol and sugar producers uh, in the world. And we also uh, went public in Brazil in November 2005, raised $400 million. Uh, recently, on September 11, for the financial market, that means August the 16th, we also went public here at the New York Stock Exchange. We raised another $1.2 billion. And during this last three years, uh, we raised more than a billion of dollars in terms of uh, uh, debt. Basically, 61% uh, of our sales comes uh, from sugar, 33% uh, from ethanol, and others uh, 6% mainly here, uh, cogeneration of uh, energy. Uh, this is changing. As you can easily guess, ethanol is growing, and it's growing fast. More than half of our uh, revenues, in fact, 60%, are generated abroad, uh, being the leading uh, exporter of sugar and ethanol in the world. We have grown and grown a lot, especially after the deregulation that we had in Brazil when the government decided to exit the industry during the 90s. Today, we have a 40 million tons of crushing capacity. We are three times larger than the second uh, player in Brazil. We are going to be addressing that. So this is basically uh, uh, Cosan. In terms of uh, the sugarcane industry, I guess that's this, in terms of our country, dates back to the 1500 when the country was uh, discovered. In, fa in fact, in 1532, uh, sugarcane was brought uh, to Brazil, and since that point in time, uh, it was key in terms of food production to get sugar. So that is a kind of usage for sugarcane that continues up to date and should continue in the future. However, during the 70s, we had major uh, uh, changes in the world arena with the, all the oil crisis, uh, the OPEC creation. Uh, therefore, the Brazilian government also, in order to reduce all the cash outflow in our uh, trade balance uh, with regards to oil, uh, started to develop uh, ethanol uh, program in Brazil, the famous uh, pro-alcohol. So that was uh, started in the uh, 775. Uh, we also developed uh, cars that were uh, powered by ethanol. Yeah. This didn't last uh, long because the technology was not that uh, great. And also because in this industry in Brazil, we are able to switch from time to time in a certain range uh, our production from sugar to ethanol or from ethanol uh, to sugar. Therefore, later on, sugar prices in the world pick up and producers in Brazil just changed their production uh, uh, to sugar, and therefore the country ran out of ethanol, and we had a kind of a, a, a disaster situation, and the whole program was uh, uh, down the drains. 
Nevertheless, uh, sugarcane as an alternative energy uh, uh, in order to produce ethanol was something that was uh, uh, born. Mm -hmm. As a result of that, uh, today the world is uh, shut such that we do have very strong regulations uh, by governments all over the world, especially uh, with regards to developed countries, okay? And that, of course, produced uh, huge distortions. When we take a look at the world uh, sugar market, basically two-thirds are protected, and here we do include all the developed countries, uh, the U.S., European Union, Japan, and so on and so forth. And just one-third is free uh, market. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, uh, we are talking about a commodity that is perhaps the cheapest commodity in terms of uh, dollars per calorie, and only one-third of the global market is free. Therefore, you can easily guess that this is a very interesting industry for uh, SPAC funds to play by putting the uh, same amount of money that they put in sugar in other commodities. They are not going to be able to maneuver as easily as they can do with sugar. As a result, we do have very huge uh, price uh, fluctuations. Uh, we can see here during the night, you know, sugar a bit over uh, 5 cents per pound and maximum achieving more than 19 cents per pound. So this is the environment that we are talking about. In terms of Brazil specifically, during the 90s, the government decided to exit this industry. So in March of uh, 1990, it decided to close down the famous uh, Instituto do Açúcar and Álcool. It was a national body that uh, uh, oversee all the, uh, the industry. Afterwards, the last national crop plan, when the government would tell you how much you could produce, the last one was in 97. Finally, 98, price control on sugar uh, was abolished, and in 99 also uh, uh, was abolished uh, in terms of ethanol. Therefore, despite the age of the industry, the industry kind of reborn uh, during the 90s, especially at the end of the 90s. Okay. Uh, by that kind of environment, uh, uh, it's easy to guess that just by signing a piece of paper, the government could change and change dramatically the profitability of the industry. Therefore, no major uh, Brazilian group, no multinational company was willing to play in that industry. Therefore, we had only family-run business that uh, uh, flourished in, in Brazil until the, uh, the 90s. With this uh, reborn of the industry, Cosan also speed up its uh, growth. As we can see here, uh, in 2002, we are crushing 13, 000, uh, uh, 13 tons of uh, sugar cane. And today, I mean, last crop, we crushed 36. And we do have now a crushing capacity of 40 million tons. So that was, a, uh, I would say, a huge increase. And one of the key ingredients of that was really uh, a free market. Okay. Uh, sales last uh, year uh, peaked at 3.6 uh, billion reais, so roughly divide that by two, you know what's in U.S. dollars. Um, our FTDA here uh, last year also reached uh, over $900 million with a FTDA margin of 26.7%. Uh, so this is basically the result uh, of, um, let's say, the exit of the government with regards to uh, our company, and especially the vision that we had in order to uh, try to be one of the consolidators in this industry in Brazil. Mm -hmm. But of course, that with this uh, aggressive growth, uh, we reached our indebtedness capacity by July uh, 2004. Mm -hmm. As we can see, at that point in time, our gross debt was at 1.3 billion reais. Uh, our net debt to FDD, uh, over 2.8 uh, times, okay? and especially with regards to the percentage of uh, short-term debt, uh, that was almost at uh, 70%. And that's important because uh, Brazil at that point in time, perhaps even nowadays, uh, we do not have a local market for long-term financing. Therefore, that was putting a lot of pressure in, in our company. Only BNDS, the State Development Bank, uh, was able to provide long-term financing in, in reais. But at that point in time, we had, you know, uh, continue our growth, uh, and therefore we are really putting uh, the company in a very, very risky uh, position. But at the same time, 
we had to do something because, uh, of course, we saw so many opportunities down the road that we didn't want to slow down the company. Mm -hmm. So, the present. Okay. During the uh, 2000, things uh, have um, evolved, and in this new century, basically, we had the uh, ratification of the Kyoto Protocol, and also in terms of Brazil, we start to verify some shortage, some blackouts of uh, energy. Mm -hmm. Therefore, uh, government decided to introduce uh, the, in our energy matrix uh, biomass. And we are going to be talking later, but uh, sugar cane, especially with regards to bagasse, is perhaps the best source of uh, biomass. Uh, also, uh, we start uh, the flex fuel cars. That was a huge uh, success. Uh, here in, in the U.S., also production uh, of ethanol uh, out of corn, uh, carbon credit uh, started to you know fly all over the world. So a lot of things things uh, changing. Therefore, sugar cane in in Brazil uh, was also a key ingredient in our energy matrix. And on an international arena, ethanol started to be seen as an international commodity for uh, renewable energy. Okay. Therefore, uh, not only food, but also uh, energy and uh, in terms of fuel and electricity. So markets uh, that could be easily uh, predictable in terms of uh, uh, high growth. However, uh, so far our strategy uh, was totally based on growth. We knew where we are, we knew where we want to go, but it was tough to get uh, you know, uh, uh, where we want uh, to be. Uh, our vision of becoming the first two global player in renewable energy uh, was extremely capital intensive. And we knew that our financial model had reached its limit. Therefore, we had to be able to put something together to, uh, to change that. that. Mm -hmm. So talking to the uh, financial market in general, uh, what was, we saw was a cold shower. Why? Because people are saying, well, guys, you are a company located in the volatile and unstable in Latin America, uh, operating in a cyclical business that is commodities. Uh, we had no previous sizable and secured long-term financing uh, out of the Brazilian agribusiness ever. In fact, Cosan was the first company to issue uh, bonds uh, out of Brazil, the Brazilian agribusiness. Uh, company had an industry with a very deteriorated image, uh, especially because uh, in the time when the government controlled the whole uh, industry, uh, people tried to get uh, uh, advantage over the government. Therefore, it was always a fight, government against the companies and, and, and mills against the government. Uh, our uh, war in indebtedness with short-term debt uh, reaching its limits, also a problem. We were a private company with no obligations to show transparency to regulating bodies and stakeholders. We had no corporate governance, neither board of directors with independent members. Yeah. And of course, any transaction that we'd be thinking about doing the uh, capital marks would be our uh, first transaction. And therefore, with a certain, uh, uh, with a certain degree of uncertainty uh, in such a transaction. But again, or we slow down the company, or we retake those challenges. Therefore, uh, a new financial strategy uh, was put together uh, in order to support our business model. And that strategy was based on eight pillars. First one, uh, assure liquidity. So we had to make sure uh, that uh, talking to our banks, they would not pull out their uh, uh, line of credit. So we have to make sure that we could count on those banks, on those uh, on loans, until we put together you know, the overall uh, financing strategy. Uh, also, in terms of the second pillar, secure financing, we had to be able to first uh, change the profile of our uh, uh, debt from short term to, to long term and make sure that we could uh, uh, increase our uh, indebtedness capacity. Third block, build strategic business flexibility. We also had to make sure that we would be able to bring new money to the company in order uh, to make sure that the company could continue uh, its growth. Optimize financing costs, 
so also in terms of the overall uh, cost of uh, capital for the company, it was a key to make sure that we could be a bit more competitive with international players, uh, not only measured against uh, uh, local players in Brazil. Establish a market platform, so make sure that we could put establish a, a investor relation area uh, that could have the same uh, language uh, to the financial market that one could understand uh, uh, each other and make sure that we could progress also on that avenue. Um, protect shareholders' value. So make sure that we not be diluting uh, existing shareholders just to, uh, for the sake of dilute. Make sure that when we move in that direction, that would be something that would, at the end of the day, add some value uh, to the existing shareholders. Strength uh, balance sheet. So we really had to make sure that uh, uh, not only our debt profile, but also our capital structure would be uh, fortified by bringing uh, uh, new capital. And finally, uh, also start to move the company up in our uh, uh, rating uh, scale from uh, a speculative uh, rating to an investment grade uh, category. So those were basically the eight pillars that uh, we conceived as being adequate to support our corporate strategy. So let's see uh, that financial uh, uh, strategy in action. And that basically starts by communicating and selling uh, to the financial market. And basically, we divided uh, in, in five pillars. Uh, we really had a very attractive industry dynamics. Uh, we had a comp with a low cost, large scale, uh, and also integrated uh, operations. Uh, besides that, we did have our uh, market position that was a very unique one our management team, and also a track record, also uh, unique in the uh, Brazilian industry. And finally, in terms of financial performance, was a very interesting one. So when we put all those uh, five things uh, together, uh, the whole story, I would say, was very, very compelling, especially because usually what you find is companies with two or three uh, of those uh, features, but no, not all the five of them together at the same time. So we really saw ourselves uh, very, very well positioned in order to grab great part of those uh, um, growth opportunities. Mm -hmm. In terms of attractive uh, industrial dynamics, when we talk about uh, ethanol, not only because of uh, uh, high oil, oil prices, but also environment concerns, what we see is really uh, ethanol demand booming to levels uh, never seen before. When we talk about sugar, basically what we see is a population migration from rural to urban areas in developing uh, countries. I mean, if you take the case of uh, China, uh, China uh, per capita consumption in uh, uh, the country is around nine kilos per uh, person. But when you go to big cities such as Shanghai, this is already at 35 kilos. When you compare to countries such as the US, the European Union, Brazil, Max, all of them over 40 kilos a year per person. Okay. Uh, also, what we are seeing developing uh, 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 countries is basically uh, uh, increase in the per, uh, per capita consumption. And in terms of uh, developed countries, what we see is really a gradual uh, deregulation of the uh, sugar regime that they, they have. So, especially in terms of Brazil, we are also talking about a very, very fragmented uh, landscape with lots of opportunity for uh, consolidation. And besides that, we do have the ever-growing uh, demand for energy. So all of these, uh, they are really shaping up uh, our industry into a very, very interesting uh, direction. Mm -hmm. In terms of um, uh, ethanol, I guess that uh, finally oil companies, they do not see ethanol anymore as a threat. Finally, they have realized by... Uh, uh, take a look at ethanol, they can see that something that when they blend to gasoline, they get first an extension of the life of their products because their reserves are, uh, are finite. Uh, second, they also start to reduce all the environmental pressure that they are receiving. Okay? And third, they make, they make their product cheaper, also a very good reason. Therefore, because of that, ethanol is really uh, growing and growing uh, dramatically. In Brazil, uh, nowadays, more than 80% uh, of the sales of new cars in Brazil, they are flex fuel cars. Flex fuel cars, as you know, are cars that run both gasoline, uh, ethanol, or a combination uh, of the two. 
Uh, we do expect that by 2010, when we are not that far away from 2010, uh, the ethanol market uh, in terms of the world would be a market almost uh, 80 uh, a billion liters, okay? So uh, 21 uh, billion gallons. Hmm. And really that uh, uh, when we compare uh, uh, sugarcane with other feedstocks, I mean, it's clear that uh, from an energy uh, efficient point of uh, view, uh, sugarcane is far more efficient. So we are talking about uh, four to five times more efficient than uh, corn, wheat, uh, or beet. Also in terms of uh, production cost, uh, sugarcane is the one that produces uh, the lowest uh, producing cost. Therefore, this is something that uh, uh, I guess that we can export uh, to other countries and we can really try to uh, share uh, the technology that we, we have in Brazil. Our mills, uh, all our uh, 17 mills are located in the state of Sao Paulo, which is by far the leading state uh, uh, in Brazil, uh, although it's just a state. Uh, in terms of area, I mean, you have many countries in Europe that could be put inside of Sao Paulo state. I'm sure that you know about the, the area of Brazil, 850 million hectares. This is basically uh, larger than the uh, continental U US. Okay. Uh, and therefore, by having uh, different mills, I guess that one can uh, hedge uh, different uh, climates. Uh, uh, also, we can be more uh, uh, responsive to clients, to market demands, uh, when we have to produce a certain uh, type of sugar or a certain type of ethanol and so on and so forth. Uh, we do have a very uh, integrated uh, platform that provides uh, flexibility so we can switch in a certain range from sugar to ethanol, from ethanol to sugar. Basically, we have the sugar cane uh, and 60% comes from uh, our own sugar cane production and the other 40% we buy from growers. We crush that uh, sugar cane and we crush that sugar cane. On one hand, we get that uh, juice and that juice, when you channel that through a, a crystallization process, you get sugar. And when you channel that through a fermentation process, you get ethanol. And then you have that leftover material. That leftover material that we call uh, bagasse is very, very rich in fiber. And when you burn that uh, uh, material in your boilers, uh, you do generate steam that moves turbine and consequently you produce uh, energy. Now we are, uh, by the way, we are self-sufficient with, with regards to, uh, to energy. Now we are changing our uh, low-pressure boilers by high-pressure boilers, so boilers that do have more than 60 bars of pressure. And by doing that, you are going to be able to use just one-third of the energy, and another two-thirds you are going to be able to uh, sell to the grid. Uh, so the same amount of bagasse that uh, you burned before, you are going to continue to burn, only that at two-thirds uh, you are going to be able uh, to sell energy uh, to the grid. Okay. Uh, also, we do have another competitive advantage, and this is our port terminals, uh, therefore mitigating the infrastructure risk that we have in Brazil. Our sugar uh, port terminal has a loading capacity of 40,000 metric tons a day, that makes us the largest uh, sugar throughput port terminal in Brazil last year, responsible for 23% of the sugar exports uh, of Brazil. Uh, we also have a 32% stake at TEAS. This is our uh, ethanol port terminal. It's the only one in Brazil that uh, fully dedicated uh, uh, to ethanol. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of leading market position, when we uh, put ourselves against the international peers, uh, in terms of ethanol or sugar production, I guess two things are important in here. First, I guess we are the only ones that uh, we have a press in both charts. So we are uh, on the left and on the right chart. Okay? And also, we are the only one among all those uh, uh, international peers that uh, we do have the capacity to shift between sugar and ethanol. Mm -hmm. And although I said that uh, we are three times uh, larger than the second player in Brazil, we barely have a 9% market share. Just to give an idea how fragmented is the market. And also look at those players. Uh, we are the only one 
that uh, we do have a track record in terms of acquisition. I guess we do know how to do them and how to do them well. And why is this important? Well, this is important because when you look at the second half of the, uh, uh, the chart, you are going to see that uh, all the other natural resource uh, industries in Brazil, uh, they do have a very strong uh, consolidation uh, landscape. Uh, in fact, the top four uh, players uh, on those industries, they are responsible for 78, 9, or even 100% of the market. So those were industries where the government did not uh, control in the past. Therefore, uh, in our case, the top five players, we do not have even 10, uh, 20% of the uh, market share. So we do expect, as we move towards the future, uh, the same con uh, consolidation path that we saw in those industries uh, to happen there in our industry. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, financial performance, I mean, last year was a, a great year. Uh, by the way, uh, we closed our fiscal year in April because we followed the sugarcane cycle. So last year was uh, uh, April 2007. We had a 45% increase in revenues, reaching 3.6 billion reais. Uh, uh, I mean, that was, again, a fantastic year. Uh, our sugar uh, output we increased by more than 45%. Uh, uh, also, ethanol, uh, we sold more than 1.3 uh, billion uh, liters. Uh, prices also uh, up. I mean, it was a year that was in our history. However, you know, things are, are not uh, uh, always that way. Uh, that, uh, you know, blue sky is over. Today we do have uh, overcapacity uh, in the world. Uh, just to come back a little bit and see what's going on. Uh, we have major changes in this industry in the last uh, 18 months or, or, or two years. Uh, Starting with the top court decision uh, of the WTO that uh, ruled against the subsidized exports uh, out of Europe uh, for sugar. Uh, so that uh, opened uh, four to five million tons gap in the free market. So all the countries start to put up production in order to try to fulfill that gap. And sugar prices start to go up, reaching the famous 19 cents uh, per pound barrier. Uh, second, uh, nobody could ever imagine that the flex fuel cars in Brazil would be that successful. As I mentioned to you, more than 85% of the sales of new cars today in Brazil, they are flex fuel. And here, even here in the US, despite all the discussion that's going on, I guess that nobody could realize that in two years, the American government would be able to mobilize resources in order to create the largest uh, ethanol market in the world. Okay. So all of these uh, really uh, incentivated, motivated uh, producers and countries to put up production. So today we do have this excess uh, uh, production that is uh, depressing prices. As a result, in the first quarter of this year, we had a huge uh, compression in our revenues, mainly because of uh, prices. Prices uh, uh, in terms of uh, sugar, our average price per ton uh, reduced 46% uh, vis-a-vis uh, uh, last year. And in terms of ethanol, we also had a, a price cut 30% uh, compared to the first quarter of last year. So this is going to be a, a much more difficult, uh, uh, I'd say, year. But as I mentioned uh, before, this should be a, a, a very poor year in terms of per performance, but a very rich one in terms of um, uh, strategic opportunities. Okay. So as a result of this uh, uh, financial strategy, I guess in October uh, 04, we accessed the uh, debt capital market when we issued the first uh, uh, bond of, out of Brazil for the agribusiness, $200 million, a five-year bond, 9% uh, uh, coupon. Uh, after that, we also uh, got a $7 million uh, uh, loan from IFC also a very important uh, one to our company. And why? Because at that point in time, basically what we are uh, uh, living, what we are facing, were the major sugar companies in the world that were knocking at our doors, uh, especially from Europe, uh, in order to, to try to acquire us. But we believe that we could continue to move on with our own legs. Therefore, we decided at that point in time not to uh, engage in any kind of uh, uh, sale. 
And by doing that, we basically uh, went uh, public, so we floated our company at Bovespa uh, Stock Exchange in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, raising another 403 million uh, uh, US dollars. And at that point in time, basically all the sugar companies in the world, that they saw that uh, we're not there to be uh, sold. However, we came to a different game, and the game was basically with the major agribusiness companies that uh, you know, and especially uh, some months ago, I guess you saw in the Wall Street Journal, uh, ADM uh, saying that they were uh, perhaps considering acquiring Cosa. And again, we also believe that we should try to move forward with our own legs because in the future, we believe that's not going to be uh, the agribusiness companies the ones to be interested in Cosan, but the major uh, energy and oil companies. Therefore, we have to make sure that uh, we are the ones to extract their, that value and not uh, uh, you know, those companies by selling to them. Therefore, we continue our route and in uh, January, February uh, 06, we also we should $450 million in perpetual bonds uh, with 80.25% uh, uh, coupon uh, out of Brazil. Uh, this perhaps is the financial transaction that I'm most proud about because the uh, interest rate was, uh, lowest, uh, it was lower than uh, the perpetual bonds of uh, banks in Brazil, such as Bradesco, Unibanco, or Santander. Okay, so that was really a major, uh, I would say, achievement. Afterwards, we continued that path. Uh, in January of this year, we also raised another $400 million 10-year bond uh, with a 7% coupon, also the lowest uh, rate uh, uh, out of a Brazilian corporate, corporation uh, uh, ever. But we had many other projects, and we knew that we had reached our, uh, I would say, maximum limit because at that point in time, we had to make sure that we would be able to do something big or we would have to slow down the growth of the company. And particularly uh, at this point in time in Brazil, any company that is in the stock exchange where the controlling block is not holding 51% uh, of the company, you can be sure that next day there is a, a hostile takeover uh, proposal because so many uh, uh, players in the world are taking a very, very close look at these companies in Brazil. So we have to make sure that we'd be able to uh, continue our project, you know, our growth, uh, and at the same time uh, controlling the company uh, or uh, slow down uh, uh, the, the growth of the company. So we had to do something in order to uh, materialize our vision of becoming the first true global player in renewable energy. Uh, so future, as we mentioned to you during the uh, this century, sugarcane is start to be uh, seen in Brazil as uh, fuel in terms of uh, uh, electricity in order uh, uh, to use the bagasse and also in the international arena uh, producing this uh, ethanol that we discussed before. However, in the near future, you also expect uh, sugarcane uh, as a basic input for the chemical industry in order to produce <coughs> plastic that are bio uh, degradables. I don't know. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, therefore, this is continuing to draw the attention of the, uh, the world. Therefore, we, again, we had to make sure that we could put the company in a, such a structure uh, to pursue these new uh, avenues. Mm -hmm. Therefore, our uh, project at that point in time was basically $1.6 billion uh, uh, capex. And we are talking about uh, a greenfield project. So this is a giant uh, greenfield in the state of Goiás that shall be crushing 10 million tons of sugarcane. Uh, if we would see this uh, project as an independent company, it would be ranking among the top uh, uh, five companies in the sugar and ethanol industry in Brazil. Uh, also, we want to put genetic improvement experimental uh, stations to make sure that we could continue to develop uh, different varieties of sugarcane according to the uh, subclimate and, and, and uh, soil of each one of the different regions in Brazil. Um, we also uh, enter into the brown, brown uh, field expansion, another 10 million tons uh, increasing capacity uh, in our company. And 
we also started the full potential program uh, with operating improvements, also uh, mechanizing the, the harvest or replacing the manual cut by uh, machines, and also uh, the cogeneration at full speed. Mm -hmm. And some general corporate purpose here, because always we are going to be continue to consider acquisitions and international opportunities. Uh, Again, uh, one cannot uh, try to be a global player uh, without have a presence in the major markets in the world. And when you talk about ethanol, of course, that the U.S. is a, a place that uh, uh, somehow we have to figure out a direct or indirect way uh, to have a presence in here. Thank you. So that was the challenge that uh, uh, we said that we would pursue. Therefore, in order to address that, perhaps we put together what was the boldest step of Cozan so far, uh, moving from Bovespa Stock Exchange and CVM uh, regulator in Brazil to the New York Stock Exchange and, and SEC here in Brazil. So that happened last uh, August when we raised $1.2 billion in a global uh, offering. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess that was a very important uh, transaction to our company. First, it was uh, the first company out of Brazil to have registered shares in the New York Stock Exchange and the third company uh, from Latin America. Other companies, they do have ADRs, but we are talking about shares. Uh, and also important was because this, uh, uh, the whole structure was a very, uh, uh, I would say, different uh, uh, one uh, with this, uh, uh, what we call plural uh, voter or majority uh, voting power. Uh, shares with two uh, different classes where the controlling bloc would ha have a 10 to 1 uh, voting power in all uh, strategic decisions, such as, for example, acquisition of a company or open operations in a different countries and so on and so forth. However, in terms of uh, any matter, any issue with regards to minority uh, uh, protection, uh, both shares, they would be uh, uh, voting equally, one to one. So it was, I would say, a nice uh, fit on how to make sure that we could uh, uh, put together something in order uh, for the company to continue its growth. So that was basically uh, uh, what we, 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 it was done. Um, therefore, I mean, before we open here for uh, questions and, and answers, and just to emphasize what you know, that companies are alike, but uh, not the same. Uh, the same medicine that could uh, work out for you, perhaps uh, for me, it's not going to uh, work that uh, out. Uh, I guess what is really important, uh, and this seems to be uh, something very simple, but it's not, is make sure that we do have an internal alignment in the company uh, on where we are, where we want to go, and how we get there. You know, those three questions are so simple, but uh, very few companies in the world, they know how to answer that. Okay. Uh, and no doubt that uh, a financial strategy that supports the uh, corporate strategy, that supports the business model, uh, does add real value. And uh, also, I guess that you have to factor in, uh, especially depending on uh, kind of industries that uh, you are going to work, make sure that uh, uh, you do not you know, get killed by uh, government protectionism or the lobby of big guys. Okay. So this is basically the you know, thoughts that I want to share uh, with you guys, more than open for uh, uh, questions. Sure. <laughs> one of the you two raised first. <laughs> um, you mentioned you want to be the first true gold mineral alternative energy, but you're kind of focused on single raw material sugar cane and a single output right now in terms of energy and ethanol, mm -hmm. but your bagasse is more burning. Mm -hmm. What about biodiesel and bio oil? I mean, the alliance with Quap, are you going to use that to process Panama biodiesel, or is that in the plan? Well, uh, at this point in time, we are really planning to concentrate on sugarcane. Biodiesel, if you take the case of Brazil, uh, the government has just uh, ruled a, a 2% mandatory blending and, and or 2% mandatory biodiesel shall increase to 5%. Uh, what happens is that uh, with regards to biodiesel, because we do have a different landscape in Brazil than uh, ethanol uh, uh, companies. Their Petrobras, they have already uh, stated that they are come into production. 
because all the biodiesel that is, is starting to be produced in Brazil comes from very small companies. And therefore, they do not believe that those companies would have the, the, the uh, financial strength, uh, the management uh, resources in order to uh, grow and perhaps become what the ethanol companies are today. Therefore, they want to speed up that, and they have already announced uh, that they are coming to uh, biodiesel production. Uh, therefore, uh, we do not um, think that uh, we should, again, try to uh, uh, segregate our uh, uh, financial resources in a business where perhaps we are not going to be number one or two. And this is our aim, I mean, in, in try to be number one or two in our business or in the marks that we uh, do operate. Mm -hmm. Yes. You mentioned that you had a cost advantage in the ethanol production, and I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit in terms of where the major sensitivities are and, and advantage, whether it's a transportation network or yield or, mm -hmm. or what are the various... Mm -hmm. I, guess, uh, I guess when we talk about uh, uh, ethanol sugar cane, we have to have in mind a couple of reasons why this is more, uh, uh, let's say, cost interesting uh, or more productive, if you like, than ethanol from a corn or from a, a wheat or beet. Uh, first, uh, sugarcane is a culture that uh, we call it's a pluriannual culture. Uh, when you plant it, you are going to cut, it's going to grow again, and then you cut, it's going to grow again, and then you cut. So uh, you are going to keep the same sugarcane with you for five, six, or seven years, different than uh, beet or uh, 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 corn that you have to plant every single year, okay? So uh, you have one harvest per year, but you keep the same uh, plant with you. So all that plantation costs, uh, you know, reduce. Uh, second, uh, we are self-sufficient with regards to energy. Different than corn or, or beet that you have to buy energy, when you look at the cost structure of those uh, uh, companies, energy does play a key role. Uh, this is not our case. We are not only self-sufficient, but as I mentioned before, uh, by changing the uh, high, low pressure boilers by high pressure boilers, we are selling uh, energy. Therefore, this is also another important um, uh, competitive advantage. And, and third, when we talk about uh, uh, biomass, uh, no other uh, culture in the world has a so uh, dense biomass per hectare than sugarcane. Uh, therefore, that also means more uh, um, uh, production. Uh, so those three things together, I mean, you could talk about many others, but I would say are very, very basic that differentiates right from the beginning sugar came from other, you know, cultures. Mm -hmm. um, the question is more to have, how does Kosan differentiate from other sugar cane ethanol producers? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, basically, uh, I, I don't think that uh, you have a lot of uh, uh, differentiation among the, uh, the companies. What you have, for example, is different strategies. For example, uh, you have, for example, two extremes and a sort of uh, producers in, in, in between. In one extreme, you have uh, ethanol producers that they do on their own land, okay? And on the other, they have uh, ethanol producers with no land where they buy 100% of the uh, sugar cane from uh, uh, growers. Uh, what happens uh, in here, this is basically a fixed cost, right? So depend on your uh, uh, guesstimate, your outlook with, with regards to sugar and ethanol prices, if uh, they are going up, you better be in that position, you better have your own land, I mean, of course, that you are going to have a much higher capital employed, but your uh, P&L is going to have much less charge. Therefore, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, profit margins, you are going to have a nice model in here. Uh, but the other way is also true. When uh, sugar prices, ethanol prices go down, by having a kind of variable uh, cost here, buying from uh, growers, uh, you are somehow keeping uh, 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 or sharing your margins with them. Uh, since this is not a fixed cost. We rather prefer to have something between 60, 40, up to 40, 60, uh, making sure that, uh, okay, we're not going to get the peaks, but also we're not going to get uh, uh, the valleys, okay? Uh, as I mentioned, we, we have perhaps other advantages that by having uh, not only one, two, or three meals, uh, we can uh, fully dedicate a certain meals to certain types of sugar or 
uh, ethanol, and therefore, in terms of uh, 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 critical mass, we can achieve that much faster than other players. And also, in case of uh, any kind of uh, weather uh, problems, it's very, very unlikely to have a, uh, you know, a weather problem uh, all over the 17 mils. I mean, if you have just one mil or two mils, we could also uh, face that. Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, infrastructure, in terms of transportation, this is a point where, uh, I guess, not only ourselves, but the whole industry in Brazil, we could improve and improve a lot. Uh, here in Brazil, for example, uh, usually when you think about uh, moving uh, uh, fewer liquids, first uh, you try to put together pipelines. Uh, you know, the second way is uh, you know, barks or, or river, and then comes you know, um, railroads, and only afterwards uh, um, highways with trucks. Brazil, unfortunately, is the other way around. We see, okay, this is the most expensive one, so let's go for that. So everything is by trucks. 100% of our ethanol, we move out of our uh, mills uh, by trucks uh, to the uh, port terminals. Okay? And even in there, we do use uh, ships that they do have one-fourth, one-fifth the size of the uh, petrol tanks. So a lot of, uh, I would say, economics, a lot of savings are there to be pursued. Of course, that we do need uh, uh, volume, we do need uh, ethanol being you know, uh, a real international commodity for renewable energy in order to... Uh, to somehow to uh, to sign uh, all those projects uh, to make them feasible, uh, but still uh, a long way to go. Mm -hmm. So it's I understand the value of uh, having the same uh, sugar cane for both sugar and, uh, and ethanol, but also you talked about genetic improvements, so will you be forced to lose some of that uh, in order to be better at ethanol or sugar cane? You talk about the genetic improvements yeah, on, on that. I, I well, this, yeah, this is something a, a little bit uh, stupid in Brazil because we are not allowed to have uh, genetic modified uh, sugar cane. We are allowed to have genetic improved but not modified. Uh, as if your car knows that, that uh, ethanol came from a genetic modified sugar cane, right? So, uh, but this is, you know, uh, Brazilian government. But it's changing. Uh, what happens is that... Uh, for example, when we talk about the next step, and this is uh, cellulosic ethanol, today we have an average in terms of uh, tons per hectare, around uh, 85 uh, tons uh, in the count per hectare okay, of sugar cane. By uh, using genetic uh, uh, modified sugar cane, we should uh, increase that to at least 150 uh, uh, tons per hectare or even over uh, 200, so a major uh, 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 jumping there. And also in terms of, uh, because what happens is that uh, you uh, develop a sugar cane that is uh, much thicker, so the stack gets much thicker, so it's much more dense in, in fibers, although the, uh, uh, the sucrose content does not uh, uh, change that much. Uh, so, by the way, sugar cane is something that uh, one-third is the sucrose inside, one-third is the, uh, the stack and the straw, and, and one-third are the leaves. Okay, and usually the leaves, um, nowadays you, you, you just lose them, you just burn uh, to facilitate the cut. But using mechanical harvest, you are also going to be able to use uh, the leaves and therefore being able to produce not only uh, uh, cellulosic ethanol, but also more energy. So uh, I would say that yes, it's going to be a matter of time that uh, genetic modified sugar cane uh, uh, will be you know, uh, something uh, normal uh, uh, to be exploring in Brazil. But uh, with this uh, genetic improved uh, uh, sugar cane that we have, I guess that we have done a lot. I mean, the second country in terms of uh, uh, sugar cane industry in the world is India. Uh, usually their companies, they do crush uh, for 140, 145 days a year. Uh, in Brazil, we crush for 200, 210 days. Okay, so we have been able to develop the early varieties or late varieties of sugar cane so we can extend uh, the crop. Okay. Mm -hmm. The question about uh, land use and as sugar and ethanol production grows in Brazil, mm -hmm. how do you see the shift in, uh, in, in land use that growing uh, as far as the shift from other products um, that's already developed land or pasture land or whether it's going to be growing in chopping down rainforests or whatever? Yeah, I guess that's a very, very important uh, question because 
unfortunately, uh, uh, from time to time we hear some, uh, you know, noises in the market, or, or we see, uh, uh, you know, some articles in, in the press that are really very, very frustrating. Uh, I guess it's important to understand. Again, Brazil is a country with 850 million hectares of land. Okay. Uh, out of that today with the existing uh, technology, uh, 320 could be used for agriculture purpose. Okay, so uh, when you, one excludes the Amazon rainforest, the Atlantic uh, rainforest, uh, uh, the Pantanal, the cities, the rivers, so we still have 320 million hectares that could be uh, used for agriculture. Uh, nowadays, only 90 uh, million, uh, they could be, uh, let's say, used uh, overnight. And in fact, we are using only 60. So overnight, we have 30 million hectares that are, are free that could be used for agriculture purpose. What is that? I mean, this is the size of Germany. This is a lot of land, okay? So when one talks about uh, uh, invading uh, uh, the Amazon rainforest and so on and so forth, really, they do not have the slightest idea uh, what they, they are talking about. Uh, basically, uh, in terms of sugarcane, we are using uh, not even uh, 7 million hectares. So it's, it's peanuts, really uh, uh, peanuts. It's 6.8 uh, million hectares. So uh, that could grow and, and, and grow a lot. And again, I guess that uh, in Brazil, we do have a, a land uh, rule um, that uh, basically the government could use all land that's not being used for a uh, uh, productive uh, uh, way. Therefore, because of that, people, they are a little bit concerned that they can lose their land uh, to the state. And therefore, uh, there is a lot of land that uh, you have a bull in here, a chicken in there, a pork in there, just to make sure that uh, there is some activity in there. But that, again, could be optimized. Therefore, uh, I would not say that uh, uh, Brazil has a problem with regards uh, to land. And again, this is with the existing uh, technology. But when we talk about, you know, genetic modified sugar cane and other techniques, I guess that could be improved a lot. Okay. Last question. So you pick the one. <laughs> okay. So we have two last questions. <laughs> Everyone is saying that jet propulsion would be the next jet propulsion fruit to become biodiesel and, you know, be the next wave of the future for alternative sources of energy. What kind of competition do you see coming from this side and affecting the market capture of sugarcane as that market? Well, it's, it's difficult to uh, say uh, what's going to be the culture that's going to prevail. Uh, if you go to Asia, there is a lot of uh, palm oil uh, uh, you know, production, and this is uh, growing. Uh, I'm not sure, at least uh, so far, what we have seen, benchmark that we, we have seen. Uh, we, we have not found other uh, plantation that has a higher biomass density than, than, than sugarcane. And especially when we consider uh, uh, the final result uh, uh, with all the genetic modifications. Therefore, this is something already proved. This is something already uh, done. This is something that the Brazil's encounter has been working and implementing and, and results are there for more than 20, 30 years. Uh, there's no doubt. I would say others are still a little bit early to say. So I have no conditions to, to comment if this is going to be the winner on another one. You know. Yeah. Thank you.